So uh, here, here's the plan for today. Um, I'm going to try to say a few things about moral theory, its nature and purposes. And when I was putting these things together, I realized it's not possible for me to adjust to these topics in half an hour. So I'm going to do the best I can and then have some space open for uh, questions. Uh, and I just realized I made an error here, but that should say consequentialism. This is what happens when we prepare for workshops the night before at 1 30. Um, but I want to very briefly introduce one of the major moral theories, consequentialism. And again, for those of you who know a little bit about this theory, you're going to be frustrated at maybe the simplicity of my presentation, but I'm hoping it will give us an outline and will be useful to people preparing for the ethics poll. And then we're going to get, get together and our false major, uh, uh, Richard, is going to uh, guide us through a case study of a very real urgent event right now, which is the famine in uh, South uh, Sudan. So we're going to get into small groups and talk about that a little bit, do a little bit of analysis like we do with the ethical case studies. And then uh, my colleague uh, Dave Weber is, is going to come and um, he's going to talk about a very famous uh, article by uh, Peter Singer, Famine Affluence Morality. It has, uh, uh, to my mind, a, a powerful argument that says uh, we're failing morally because we don't do nearly enough to address the issues like family. So that, that's sort of the, the, the plan for today. Um, I thought I'd start with, with a question. Because one thing that we've talked a lot about, a lot about when we do ethics poll preparation is uh, how much moral theory do you need to know? And I had this question from teachers. You know, I'm not a moral philosopher. I mean, how am I going to, to guide, guide a team? And so the, the role of moral theory is a really kind of interesting one. Uh, in, in, in ethics itself, but also, also for, for preparing for ethics poll. So here's a quick answer I'm going to give, and you might actually argue with me, and that's, that, that's fine. Um, my view is, what, what do you actually need to do well in ethics poll? I think these are probably the major skills. You need to be able to read closely and carefully. You need to be able to think critically, to construct arguments, and to evaluate those arguments. Uh, you need to be open to diverse perspectives. Uh, you need to be curious. I don't, I don't think you can actually overstate that one. And also, have the initiative to try to, um, to satisfy your curiosity. And because of the, it's a competition, public speaking plays, plays a certain role. Um, now, here's a question. Is it necessary to understand moral theory to give a strong moral analysis of the ethic? ethics full of case studies. Let me just ask you, just maybe as a show of hands for the room, um, how many people think, yes, you need to know some moral theory to do well? Interesting. Let's see, one, two, three. Right, put your hands back up. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, I saw yours. I have nine, nine yeses. How many no's? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, we're split down the middle. And I don't know, so it's not, it's not gonna help. Um, actually, I'm gonna tell you my view, and obviously a lot of you disagree, so this might actually be a fruitful conversation. Um, here's my view. My view is no. Yes, no wins. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think this. The main reason I think this is the fact of the matter most professional ethicists who work in applied ethics do not explicitly appeal to a developed moral theory. Uh, and it will be very interesting when we see Peter Singer's argument, because Peter Singer is a utilitarian, so he's, he's an exception in that he, he is somebody that does support moral theory. But in his famous article, A Famine Affluence of Morality, he actually distances himself from utilitarianism. You know, he tries to construct an argument that you can accept whatever your moral theory is. Um, so, it, if you just look through the literature in applied ethics, and you look at many of the major art, uh, articles, you'll find people that do have, um, sometimes we know that they do support a moral theory in their other work, uh, but often they don't appeal to it explicitly. Rather, they appeal to principles, they appeal to rights, they appeal to harms, they appeal to consequences but they never defend a full-blown moral theory. And there's a reason for that. You know, if 
you send an article to a philosophy journal and say, you know, X is, is the right thing to do because of utilitarianism, you set yourself up to fulfill a pretty daunting task, which is actually defending utilitarianism. All right. So my short answer is no. And I, I think this is true. I think you can put together a very strong analysis of the cases without having an explicit moral theory. But what is moral theory? I understand it. It's, so they tend to tell us you know, why certain actions are right or wrong. So it gives a general explanation of rightness and wrongness. Uh, and it tries to give a systematic explanation and justification for, for moral judgments. So you know, we make thousands, probably tens of thousands of moral judgments. A theory should be able to take all of those and explain why they're moral. Um, and then it should provide guidance in cases where our moral intuitions are clear or contradictory. So the whole point of having a theory is that when we run out to hard cases where we're not sure how to answer them, you know, our moral theory, because it's systematic, because it's accounted for a, a lot of different judgments, when we see the new cases, it will help us make sense of those. So the, this is kind of, kind of, kind of what I, I, I have in mind uh, here. Um, and I, I've said I don't think ethic followers need to focus a lot on moral theory, but I think they can be very helpful. So these, these are sort of three ways I think they can be helpful. So one is, is they can help you organize your argument. You know, they provide a framework. And they, they can help you make sure that your different intuitions are uh, systematic. And, you know, moral theories, you know, contain reference to usually widely held uh, or widely accepted moral principles. Uh, so I, I think, you know, knowing about moral theory can actually make your analysis stronger because you can use it as kind of a heuristic for putting out an argument. Um, second, second point is I think they're often tools. You know, once you know the moral theories, you can test them out uh, on, on the cases. So if you're stumped with a case, you're not sure you know, how to make sense of different intuitions, you can step back and say, well, you know, if I were, you, if I were you, uh, you would kill a you know, how would I respond to this if I were a con? You know, what would I think out of this? If I were a virtuous, virtue advocate, if I were a feminist uh, uh, moral philosopher. So I, I think in all, often in cases, knowing the moral theories can help you see things in the cases that you would otherwise miss if you weren't familiar with the, uh, the, the moral theories. And then the last, last one, um, which is kind of a more practical one, which is even if you don't rely on a lot of moral, moral theory, other cases, <laughs> me. And that might be actually pretty helpful because if somebody bring, brings up a moral theory and you don't know what they're talking about, then you're going to have a hard time responding. So there's a good practical reason, you know, especially if you, you want to do well in the competition for being familiar with moral theories. What I want to do now is just talk about one of the major moral theories. And in, in some ways, at least in my mind, it's kind of the most intuitive moral theory. Um, and it's, called, it's consequentialism. And consequentialism, it, it, it's a moral theory that basically says actions are right or wrong depending on the consequences. And that seems to be kind of a very straightforward uh, view. How is something right or wrong? Well, let's find out what, what happens when you do that and, and assess it on that, that dimension. Now, this is a very general description of consequentialism. Um, but it, every consequential theory has, has, has two components. One is it lists a good or the good or various goods. Now, what does that mean? Well, usually it references things like happiness. Some consequential theories say freedom is what matters. Some say you know, what we're concerned about is, is, is equality. Some uh, consequential theories are what are called pluralist theories, and they have a number of different uh, dimensions. But so the consequentialist theories, first of all, list what is good, what we want to bring up about in the world. And then second, they have a principle that says promote the good. So when you're trying to figure out what's the right thing to do, you do something that brings about whatever is, is good. Um, and then there's different ways of promoting 
the good. Uh, some theories say you ought to maximize it. That seems sometimes a little bit uh, burdensome. You know, you always have to act in a way that brings out the maximum good possible and maybe sacrifice your own interests. Other theories say you don't have to maximize, but you have to do something. Sometimes walk is called a satisfying So you should bring about the good, but you don't have to do the most good, you just have to do uh, some good. So two components for consequentialism. Uh, the most famous version of consequentialism is, is utilitarianism. And this is uh, Jeremy Bentham, who was one of the major uh, figures in, in uh, uh, utilitarianism, he was a, he was a jurist, actually, a, a, a lawyer, and he thought that the way that England was structured in the uh, 18th and 19th century was rational, that what we ought to do is we ought to reformulate the legal system, the social system, in a way that promotes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So he took a very kind of seemingly obvious intuition that it's better to be happy than sad, and it's better for more, happy, be, uh, more people to be happy than just a few people to be happy, and he suggested that the basic principle of morality is to promote you know, the greatest happiness for the greatest number of um, uh, people. And you notice how this is a moral, this counts as a moral theory, because they say this is the basis of morality. In any case, when you're trying to figure out what to do or how to organize an in, in, in institution, uh, you look at it and you ask, is this the action or is this the set of arrangements that's likely to make as many people as happy as possible, and then we have to balance off any pain it causes or any unhappiness. So you add up the happiness, subtract the unhappiness, and whatever gives you the greatest sum, we see that this version. And he actually worked this out in quite a bit of detail. Um, he, um, you know, that, that's what you ought to do. So the good for men is happiness. The principle is maximize happiness for as many people as possible. Um, let me just make a very basic distinction. Now, next workshop, we're going to talk about the ontology, which some people might argue is unfortunately named, but that's the way it's usually done. Um, the ontological theories hold that there's a duty to follow some rules or principles independently of consequences. So this is one of the basic divides in world theory. On one hand, you have theories that say what we care about is consequences. On the other hand, you have theories that say, look, there's some things that are just right or wrong, regardless of what happens in the world. Or at least, you know, consequences aren't all that matters. You know, maybe sometimes you shouldn't do some things, even if it has good consequences. Um, so we're going to talk about this in our next workshop, but I, I thought I'd give a, a, a quick example that we can actually cover next workshop. But, um, this is often, this debate comes up in the debate about torture. And, Philosophers and obviously others, such as governments, ask the question, is it ever permissible to torture someone? And sometimes the ontologists hold that the answer is no. It's never permissible to torture somebody, and it's wrong because it's cruel, it's inhuman, and or it violates human dignity. So people have argued that you know, torture is wrong uh, regardless. And uh, you know, you can cite things. You know, that, that captures this intuition point that our Article 5 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You know, no one's shall be subjected to torture or to cruel or to degrading treatment or punishment. Um, so, so some of the ontologists will say, look, we're just going to take torture off the table. It's one of those things that's just wrong. Whatever's going to happen. Consequentialism, this is one worry some people have, is they'll say, well, look, usually it's wrong. But you have to look at the consequences. And it's possible under some circumstances maybe it's justified. 